pride and honor to be presenting at Echo Rounds today and in person for the first time in a, a very long time. So I'll be presenting um, aortic valve disease across the different ages that I see at St. Michael's Hospital. So our learning objectives for this morning are to appreciate the impact of aortic valve stenosis on the development of the left ventricle, understand the relationship between aortic valve pathology and coarctation of the aorta, and counsel on the options for family screening in aortic valve disease. So let me start with a case. So Mrs. A is at 24 weeks uh, gestational age, and she was referred um, because of an abnormality that they saw on obstetrical ultrasound. And here is a fetal echocardiogram, which it will be somewhat familiar and somewhat unfamiliar for our um, ECHO colleagues here. Um, but I sort of consider a fetal echocardiogram to be a cross between um, ultrasound, like a, a transthoracic echocardiogram, and a cardiac MRI, because the fetus is completely surrounded in fluid and lungs are filled with fluid. And so you can completely see through the chest without worrying about air displacing some of the uh, ultrasound. So if I go back, and play. Here we're seeing the four chambered view of the heart, and we're sweeping up to the left ventricular flow tract, the five chamber view. So, four chamber view to five chamber view of the heart. Um, and the diagram on the right um, gives you the orientation. The right ventricle is on the right side of your screen, and the left ventricle is on the left side of the screen. And from here, you can appreciate a balanced four chamber heart. Um, but you can also see that the mitral valve uh, leaflets look um, slightly echogenic. Um, and when I play color, oops, you're able to appreciate there's mitral valve regurgitation as well as aortic valve stenosis. So you can see um, increased velocity across the, the aortic valve. Very cool. The peak gradient here exceeds 250 centimeters per second. Normally, it's less than 80 centimeters per second. So normally less than 80. Here, we exceed more than 250. So the fetus has a diagnosis of aortic valve stenosis, balanced for chamber heart with some echogenicity of the mitral valve. And so what is the expected prognosis and outcome of this fetus? So the range of outcomes can range from um, aortic valve stenosis to developing a uh, coarctation of the aorta to developing a Schoen's complex with multiple levels of left ventricular um, upflow tract obstruction uh, to hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Oh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And so this was my project when I was an echo fellow at SickKids looking at the outcomes of aortic valve stenosis in the fetus. And how the progression occurs varies depending on um, the impact of the different valve structures that are affected, but not completely predictable. And so you can start off with a relatively balanced four chamber heart and can have postnatal outcomes with mild uh, discrepancy between the left and right uh, sides of the heart all the way to a hypoplastic left heart syndrome where the left heart is so small that it's not able to support a systemic circulation and hence a single ventricle palliation is required. So the same fetus can have very different outcomes depending on the growth and development of that left ventricle. So how does that happen? So just as we have normal values for adult heart structures and we have normal values for pediatric heart structures, there are also normal values for fetal heart structures that uh, vary depending on the gestational age of the fetus. And we can see that once you are below um, the normal values, as the fetus continues to grow, there is a continued drop off in growth of that left ventricle with aortic valve stenosis. And the theory here is this no flow, no grow hypothesis. So from animal studies, if you put a, place a bee in the left ventricular outflow tract, uh, let's say a frog heart or a lamb heart, um, and allow the fetus to grow, you can see that that side of the heart becomes underdeveloped. 
So because there's less flow across that structure, there's less growth of that cardiac structure. Postnatally, um, we would do a balloon aortic valvuloplasty for aortic valve stenosis. And so this is a procedure that you guys would be very familiar with, but we do this in the pediatric population as well. Yeah. And we can see that not only does um, it alleviate the, the aortic valve stenosis, but it can also encourage the growth of the left ventricle post balloon valvuloplasty. And this is this uh, is dependent, but also independent on the degree of aortic valve insufficiency. So relieving the uh, aortic valve stenosis can encourage the growth of the left ventricle. So then extrapolating that back to the fetal population, um, over the past 20 years or so, they've done fetal interventions for aortic valve stenosis. So knowing that some fetuses with aortic valve stenosis will develop um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, recurring single ventricle palliation, um, uh, aortic valvuloplasty in the fetus has been offered. And so much more complicated, obviously, and in conjunction with our high-risk obstetrics um, colleagues, um, but very a, a procedure very much like aortic valvuloplasty in the postnatal population, where a balloon is guided across the uh, aortic valve and inflated to reduce the degree of aortic valve stenosis. So here is a uh, picture depicting the same. So on top, you see the catheter going into the uterus. Um, and then here we see the tip of the left ventricle. And here is the aortic valve. And in the other picture, you can see the catheter has entered the tip of the left ventricle and is about to cross the aortic valve. Now, remarkably, I know this sounds very scary, but Babies after they're born, having had this procedure done, no scar. Look at their chest, you're like, this baby's been stabbed in the chest with a catheter, cannot tell where that catheter has ever gone. So they heal beautifully. The valve heals beautifully as well, because a lot of times the aortic valve stenosis will recur because the valve has healed from the balloon valvuloplasty. And so this is not a definitive procedure, but temporizing in order to encourage the growth of that left ventricle. And so looking at all the different outcomes, from well, having not had a balloon dilation to having had a balloon dilation, was it successful? What is it not successful? What was the outcome? To summarize, following the a balloon dilation of the aortic valve, technically successful within a, a tertiary care setting in 85%, resulting in fetal demise in about 8% of the fetuses. 50% will develop a two ventricle circulation. So the procedure is successful in being able to encourage the growth of that left ventricle, whereas 50% of the time it's not successful, they continue on to a single ventricle regardless of the procedure. When it's not technically successful, same uh, percentage will have fetal demise. Um, about a very few will develop a two ventricle uh, circulation and the majority will have single ventricle palliation. So even if it's technically unsuccessful, there are a few that can have a two ventricle um, circulation. So this is really a high risk, high reward situation, but also within a, a large degree of uncertainty of what the outcome for this specific fetus might have been. And so in terms of a longer term outcome at six years of those who underwent a successful balloon dilation in the fetal stages, 92% will have transplant free survival. Whereas if they um, had a single ventricle palliation, it's closer to 72%. So Mrs. A um, underwent fetal balloon uh, dilation of the aortic valve. Um, subsequent fetal echocardiogram demonstrated improved flow across the aortic valve, improved function, of the left ventricle, fetus will continue to be monitored very closely throughout the pregnancy and postnatally will likely require balloon dilation of the aortic valve again with possible ROS procedure down the road, but hopeful for two ventricle circulation. So that was uh, aortic valve stenosis in the development of the left ventricle, um, significant impact in the neonatal stages, but especially in the fetal stages in impacting outcomes. Any questions here? Is the procedure echo guided? Echo guided, yes. So the fetal echo cardio uh, sonographer as well as a high risk animal. What just is the idea of the procedure? So the larger the baby, the the 
better the procedure, but um, it really depends on when the aortic valve stenosis is diagnosed and if there's any evidence of impact on the left ventricle. So we saw the echogenicity in that mitral valve. That was a, a trigger that we needed to do something that otherwise the outcome would have been poor. It's presumably the, the earlier you to be the, the better chance to help the, the volume of the left ventricle. But the later you be that the easier it's possible. Correct. Exactly right. Exactly right. I have a question like So you want to put off any major surgery as much as, much as possible. Um, again, the older, healthier the child is at the time of any major surgery, the better the outcomes. And so ideally you would temporize with the dilation of the aortic valve, but at some point you develop enough aortic valve insufficiency that you need to go ahead with surgical repair. Um, and so it uh, depends on, the timing really depends on the degree of aortic valve stenosis. Is there any questions? These folks uh, have associated syndrome. Right. So at, um, you want to test for those as much as possible before yeah, sure, the sure, procedure, yeah. but um, definitely at, with Mrs. A, especially at the time of the procedures with the amniocentesis, right. Right. yes, to check for genetics and outcomes. Okay, that next learning objective appreciate the relationship between aortic health pathology and coarctation of the area. So speaking of genetic syndromes, this is baby B and fetus B um, in utero had a nuchal translucency measured. So this is a measurement done um, at 12 weeks gestational age. The higher the number, the greater the likelihood there is a genetic condition or congenital heart defect. And so this is a first trimester screening test performed at 12 weeks to determine um, possible risks. And because of the increased nuclear transit, the fetus underwent genetic testing and mesentesis, and this was the result. So you can see that all the numbers are paired, except for down here, X and Y. So these are the sex chromosomes. There should be two Xs or one X and one Y. And you can see here, there's only one X. So this is Turner syndrome, 45 X zero. Um, Turner syndrome is a genetic condition where one of the sex chromosomes is missing. It's associated with a number of uh, different congenital abnormalities, including cardiovascular abnormalities in about, I would say, 20 to 40 percent. And the recommendation in terms of uh, screening is that there are risk of hypertension and coarctation of the aorta. So they should be uh, blood pressure and femoral pulses assessed at each and every medical visit. So baby B, at the time, um, fetus B, underwent fetal echocardiogram, which demonstrated normal intracardiac anatomy. And this was the morphology of the aortic valve. So looks like a candy cane. And here it looks fairly wide open with low velocity laminar flow. So pretty normal looking fetal echocardiogram. Baby was born a little bit early, a bit preterm, so was admitted to our NICs with some close-on respiratory support. So you here you see some high flow um, air happening here. Not our baby, stop future. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was the postnatal echocardiogram. So the baby had a normal fetal echocardiogram, but also needs a postnatal echocardiogram because a fetal echocardiogram will pick up major congenital heart defects, but things like a bicuspid aortic valve is not something you could feasibly see in utero. And so here is the fetal echocardiogram. So perishable short axis view zoomed up to the aortic valve. I've stuttered a bit, but it's a bicuspid aortic valve, which is common in girls with Turner syndrome. And here, is the assessment of the aortic arch. And so you can see here, we have the same candy cane that looks wide open. There's a bit of flow acceleration right here at the aortic isthmus, but the gradient is not very high, 23. There's a duct PDA that's open, that's shunting from the descending aorta to the main coronary artery. So the aortic arch appears unobstructed in the context of an open ductus arteriosus. And this is important because as the ductus closes, 
some of the ductal tissue may be making up a part of the wall of the um, aortic isthmus. So that may constrict as the duct continues to constrict. Proctation of the aorta presents in 5% of congenital heart disease, so fairly common congenital heart defect. There's an aortic arch obstruction, so you can keep, see here at the aortic isthmus. And in the neonatal population, it can create a duct-dependent perfusion, or in older um, children and adults, you can develop a collateral circulation, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Main findings, upper limb hypertension, an arm to leg blood pressure gradient of more than 20 millimeters systolic. So your arm blood pressure is 20 millimeters higher than your leg blood pressure, decreased uh, amplitude of femoral pulses, and lower limb cyanosis in neonates. So there's an obstruction as blood is going through the aortic arch. And so if the ductus is open, the ductus can potentially shunt from the pulmonary artery to the descending aorta. So in neonates, the pulmonary pressures are still high. And so if the descending aorta pressures are lower than the pulmonary pressures, they will shunt from the main pulmonary artery to the descending aorta, resulting in lower limb cyanosis. And so same baby, they have life three, so uh, five. So three days later, you can see that the uh, gradient across the um, aortic isthmus has gone up from 23 to 39. So as the ductus has closed, there's been an increased constriction across the aortic isthmus. And so here we have duct-dependent perfusion. If that duct continues to close, then there's a significant uh, lower pressure in the descending aorta resulting can result in lower limb cyanosis and shock. The management here is to start prostaglandins to reopen the ductus and then definitively surgical repair. And so an end-to-end -end anastomosis where they remove the part of the aorta that's narrowed, put the two ends back together. And this is usually through a left thoracotomy. In older uh, uh, children and in adults, they tend to develop a collateral circulation um, and may present as hypertension rather than shock or lower limb um, cyanosis. And the definitive management here generally is a balloon dilation and stent. So baby B underwent end-to-end -end anastomosis repair of her coarctation of the aorta. So the two lesions tend to go together, not always, but definitely if you're seeing one, you're looking for the other. And coarctation of the aorta can develop over time. And so not having a coarctation at one point in time doesn't mean that it's never going to develop. Any questions about relationship between aortic valve disease and coarctation? So I would say, if you're ever called to read an echocardiogram in the pediatric population, if the ductus is still open, make sure that you add the context that the, that the ductus is still open when you're saying the aortic arch is unobstructed. Because once that, that the ductus closes, that situation can change very quickly. Okay, finally, counsel on the options for family screening in aortic valve disease. Okay, so little Charlie and Mr. C. Mr. C is an adult patient here, followed by Dr. Chow, who has a bicuspid um, aortic valve. And, uh, and he and Charlie has been referred for screening. So I'm glad I'm here in person with all of you in the room. Let me see if I can open. Okay. Right. So when would you recommend that little Charlie be screened for the same by a aortic valve with an echocardiogram? Option one, prenatal, so a fetal echocardiogram. Option B, at birth. Option C, now, he's, three, uh, he's nine months of age. Um, D, later in life. And then E, never, if there are no clinical findings. Oh, I see. I see a chat. Okay. Oh, okay. So how many would choose A, prenatal? 
There's no hands up in the room. <laughs> I guess for me, with like you mentioned, you you probably can't diagnose it immediately, but if you can screen for other congenital abnormalities that are associated with gastric bypass, that's probably that's probably what I'm trying to say. So that, I I know what guidelines are, but it makes sense to screen immediately. Okay, so that's uh, that's option A. So. That was the choice in the chat, but not the choice in the room, generally speaking. Okay, B at birth. How many would choose B at birth? So one hand up. And then C now, nine month old. Couple of hands up. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised to see our phenomenon's hands up. It's easier to scan, right? I think nine months too, it's not easy to scan, but at least better. <laughs> and then D later in life. So a few hands up for D. And then E never if there are no clinical findings. I don't see any hands up for D. Well, I, I would want to know more history about yes. the father. And understand i mean it's the commonest inherited condition one percent and we never do prenatal screening so yeah, <laughs> yeah I, you know it's true I, I i think it depends if it's going to change our management so yes absolutely so the answer absolutely is it depends <laughs> so, genetic screening and a bicuspidary valve so very common so 0.5 to 2 percent in the general population with the vast majority of adults probably not knowing that they have a, a bicuspidarity valve, right? Mm -hmm. Associated with left heart obstructive lesions, so partition of the aorta, but also hypoplastic left heart syndrome and Schoen's complex, as well as aortic root dilation and aortic aneurysm. So it's a part of an aortopathy or left ventricular alpha tract. <laughs> Recurrence risk is eight to nine percent. So usually I say five to ten percent, right? In that range. So if you have one parent with a bicuspidarity valve, the chances that the child will have a bicuspidarity valve is about 5 to 10%. So it's higher than the general population, but not a huge number. It's not like 50% or 100%. Okay? And there's limited role for genetics testing in terms of like a blood test looking at the gene for a bicuspidarity valve because there's so many different genes involved and not all the genes have been identified. The American Heart Association uh, recommendations is that the first degree relatives uh, of patients with a bicuspidarity valve um, and or aortic pathology, so aortic aneurysms or aortic disease like coarctation of the aorta should undergo screening. But this is a, a level C, so just an expert recommendation um, and um, doesn't really talk about timing, when. Okay. So here's my recommendation. So if there's a history of a coarctation of the aorta or left ventricular left tract obstruction, more complex disease, then I would recommend the fetal echocardiogram. So going back to Ms. Ms. A, the fetus that had aortic uh, uh, valve stenosis, um, there was a paternal history of a bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta. And so the first pregnancy, I did the fetal echo, it was, uh, fetus was normal. We didn't do a postnatal echocardiogram. The child has been perfectly fine since without any further concerns. Second pregnancy is where we discovered the aortic valve stenosis. So now we're going to go back and screen first child. Um, but uh, when there's a more complex history, then we would want to do a prenatal screening. Recognizing, of course, this is not going to diagnose a bicuspid aortic valve. What we're looking for here is more complex disease. At birth, again, if there is a uh, common history of a coarctation of the aorta, even if the fetal echo was normal. Now, at nine months of age, I would say it's probably the worst time to do a, a pediatric echocardiogram. Um, they will not want an echocardiogram <laughs> and will let you know, <laughs> unless you can bribe them sufficiently, but it's difficult. It's a difficult age. And so, so this is generally where I would start off with a clinical exam. And so if there is a murmur or decreased sumo pulses or any other concerns, then you can try, or if you have an exceptionally cooperative nine-month-old. Um, but by and large, this is the time when I would say, you know what, let's wait a little bit. There's no harm in waiting. 
Okay. Or you dip the pacifier in gravel. And <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. Sorry, that's my secret. I don't. I do not have the nursing support for sedation and athletic. <laughs> that's right. So generally, um, I would say if there's no clinical findings, we would try to wait until they're around three to four years of age. That's generally when they can sit still for a little bit longer, um, and you can distract them with like technology, um, and they can cooperate with an exam, right? So if there's no murmur or other clinical findings, there's no rush. So the two best times to do a screening assessment is soon after birth or after three or four years of age. But never, if there are no clinical findings, is also a completely valid option. If there's not an, also a family history of aortic pathology, like a partition of the aorta or aortic aneurysm, it's also okay that the child doesn't get a screening echocardiogram if there are no murmurs or other findings. So these are the options I give to the families, and depending on their specific context, degree of family history, and their comfort level, we sort of explore these options to see. So with little Charlie, who was very happy with dad, but not happy with me in clinic, we decided there's no murmur, the femoral pulses were normal, Let's go ahead and wait, and they can always be referred back at an older age um, if they want screening or if there's an, ever a murmur. That's what's up. So we talked about the impact of aortic valve stenosis on the development of the left ventricle. We talked about the relationship between aortic valve pathology and coarctation of the aorta, particularly in the neonatal period where the, the aortic arch can change dramatically as the ductus closes. And then we talked about the different options for family screening in aortic valve disease. Any questions? Uh, uh, Ra, just want to clarify something because this question comes up all the time when we follow out by cuspid patients. So number one is, what, what is the likelihood like um, in terms of the offspring um, if either father or mother has bicuspid aortic valve without a, a coarctation because that's a much more common scenario that we see. Uh, and is it more likely that the father has it or mother has it that would pass on uh, to the kid? Right. So the literature would suggest a recurrence risk of eight to nine percent. It doesn't discriminate uh, based on coarctation or not, or aortic aneurysm or not. But likely, the like the finding of those additional pathologies would confer an increased risk. So the general risk I give is five to ten percent. Is it more likely with father or mother? So it's more likely if mother has a bicuspid aortic valve, primarily because a bicuspid aortic valve tends to be more common in males. And so it, because it's less common in females, the recurrence risk is higher when a female is affected. Um, but I would say not enough to justify changing that recurrence risk from five to 10% dramatically. Sorry. <laughs> So the question is, if you have an adult who has a bicuspid aortic valve, would you recommend first degree relatives be screened? And I would say when you are um, discussing the diagnosis of a bicuspid aortic valve with a patient, the, the fact that there is a higher recurrence risk should be discussed and then um, have a discussion with the, with the family about the options for screening. And so it's not necessarily that everyone should be screened. The question is, um, given the family context, there's a higher likelihood if there's, that there are other family members also affected, is this something that they would want to screen for or not? If there is, also, aortic, pathol uh, aortic pathology, like a uh, aortic aneurysm and coarctation, I would definitely recommend screening. Yeah, I think because it's such a simple test to get an echo, most of us generally would say at some stage get it, get it. Right, right. Uh, and most people want it actually. They usually come in asking. So, yeah, the, the one issue is is, is how it affects. 
want to get life insurance. Yeah, that's why I usually don't do it until it's, we it's, put that it's cover. Big impact. Does it? Yeah, it really it, Like Chiming, uh, you've been involved in um, actuarial uh, science. Um, like, how much does a bicuspid aortic valve affect your your life insurance policy? So the question was. have stepped away. <laughs> so the question, Chiming, are you there? Okay. That's that's good. Good. So, so this is, I think, the part that, as a pediatric cardiologist, we don't really consider that impact, right? Because we don't, the kids generally don't have like insurance policies or any like no, their no. insurances, and so we don't really consider the impact. But I think that's an important discussion to have because there are negatives to this screening, right? And unlike genetic screening, this is something you do have to disclose when you're applying for insurance. Right. Um, so I think that's that's important to know. Uh, and then screening at some point, the question rises at, at what point, right? And so if it's something that it impacts something like life insurance, then I think it's important that the kids get to be adults so they can make their own decisions, right? And so then there's that consent process that's important as well because they may develop thoughts and beliefs that are different from their parents. Um, and so it's important to respect their autonomy as well. Yeah, the other group we get is the athletes. So I've got parents with bicuspids and usually we, I recommend they get insurance and then we'll screen. Because yeah. then I'm worried about the aneurysm risk and what's depending on what sort of athletic in, you know, endeavor they are undertaking, then that's can be more of a concern. I've got a number of weight lifters, so. <laughs> and, and it's like, and obviously we don't really know what to do. We blank, blanket, you know, recommend if you've got an aneurysm, you shouldn't lift weights. We actually have no data to support that. So it's yeah. a little bit awkward sometimes, right? But at least if you identify an aneurysm, I, I, I think it probably is helpful yeah. that they can then consider yeah. that. But yeah, it's not easy. Yeah. Oh, Chiming, so the question was from, from your knowledge, what impact does a bicuspid aortic valve? have on life insurance? Oh, I have um, some uh, life insurance experience in there. And uh, first of all, the, the rules is whenever my patient asks me, make sure you actually buy the life insurance before you actually do screening, especially for your children, okay. because it can affect the risk. Um, uh, by customer aortic valve on its own in the insurance rating scheme, actually, um, uh, like, unless it's severe aortic stenosis or severe AI that, you know, is likely uh, need surgery soon, um, I think they are still insurable uh, with or without uh, aortic aneurysm. So each of them, the bicuspid aortic valve itself has a rating and, and the aneurysm piece depends on how big it is as also a rating. So that means your premium will actually go up. And uh, as a medical director, what we end up, I used to do that. And uh, what we used to do uh, or what we did was um, you, you add up all these things, like whether you have bicuspid and, and yes or no, and then whether you have aortic aneurysm and then whether you have... Um, coactation, and then you add them all up, and then you, you end up having a rating. So typically, the rating scale is like 50, 50, 50. So for each of them, if they're not that bad. Uh, and then with that number, then you actually filter this into a calculator to come up with your premium. That means you, you end up actually having to pay more uh, if you are insurable. And then there are certain people that are not insurable if their aortic aneurysm is quite big or uh, you you are likely to get surgery and and your uh, AI or AS is actually quite bad. And but on the other hand, I've also seen cases after they get operated, then they're insurable <laughs> because now your aortic valve is fixed. So the different scenarios and, and it's often worthwhile uh, to go like to to try and then they will tell you and then you can work with your insurance agent to actually sort out these risk and you know it's a it's a back and forth uh, process. Any other questions or thoughts? Many towels of Dr. Chow. <laughs> you know, we've got a, a, a mouse, the Enos knockout mouse, which develops bicuspid valve pretty much 100% of the time, right? Left fusion, but we still haven't been able to figure out why. Right. Yeah, so it's the only good animal model, but they don't get an aor aortic dilatation. Right. So it's it's been an area we've tried to study, but we don't. Yeah, it's been difficult actually to try and emulate what happens to humans. It's probably flow, and we don't have the same flow dynamics, so that's why you don't get any aneurysms. But yeah, it's, uh, it's not not been an easy thing to study.
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Over to you, Shimi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so short and sweet and uh, cannot, like, you know, it's always fun to, to find out that uh, pediatric cardiology can be so much fun. And, uh, you know, we, we owe it to uh, having the uh, access to Dr. Han with us. And uh, she spends uh, at least one, uh, one and a half days with us uh, in the cardiology clinic. So for those people who need help in terms of uh, pediatric cardiology, please refer to her at St. Louis Hospital. And then also we, we, we want to mention that uh, we're very privileged to have our uh, some of our sonographers actually trained uh, in um, congenital uh, and pediatric uh, echo screening. And uh, like it's uh, additional skills, uh, it's a great uh, sort of diversion to all the adults that you have to do. But uh, uh, we have a wonderful set of uh, sonographers who, who actually perform these um, congenital heart disease uh, or pediatric cases with Dr. Han. So uh, we're very privileged to have this combination and, and uh, team methods uh, in our group. So 